Hello and welcome to our video dialogue series, Voice and Choice, Civics in the Early Grades. My name is Rashid DeRoso and I'll be your host throughout this experience. Beyond co-producing this project, I serve as the Civics Program Director at Democracy Prep Public Schools, a national network of charter schools founded with the explicit mission of preparing the next generation of decision makers. I'm also a member of the Democracy Ready New York Coalition and serve on the board of the Inquiring Minds Institute. Thank you for joining us today as we delve into a topic that's not only timely, but essential for the nurturing of informed, responsible, and engaged citizens, establishing a high quality civic learning ecosystem for our youngest learners. This project is a continuation of a conversation that began in last year's webinar, Civic Learning in the Early Grades, a whole school, whole child endeavor, which took place during last year's New York State Civic Learning Week. Recognizing the importance of hearing directly from those who stand to benefit the most from civic education, we've taken a unique approach in today's webinar. We believe that young people themselves are the most compelling advocates for their own education. Therefore, we've invited a diverse group of young individuals to share their perspectives. You'll hear firsthand from a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, an 11-year-old, and a 17-year-old. Each will offer their unique insights on what civic engagement means to them, reflecting on their innate sense of fairness and their capacity for meaningful participation in their communities. These young voices will remind us of the potential and urgency of embedding civic education into our educational systems from the earliest stages. Their stories and perspectives will not only inspire, but also challenge us to reimagine how we approach teaching civic values and responsibilities. Now I'm thrilled to introduce this project's co-producer, DK Holland, who will share some framing to explain the aims of this video. DK is a designer, writer, researcher, and community organizer, as well as the founder and executive director of the Inquiring Minds Institute. She's passionate about helping young children develop their civic mindedness. The Institute innovates ways to improve civic engagement in elementary schools in particular through inquiry methods and by working directly with children. DK is a practicing Quaker. By getting to know the youngest friends in her Brooklyn meeting, she started to switch her focus to civics in 2008. It was as the first resident at TED that she sharpened her focus on advocating for civic agency for children in elementary school. DK serves on the Executive Committee of Democracy Ready New York. Let's hear what DK has to share. DK, I'm really happy to come together again for us to discuss voice and choice, civics in the early grades. This is a continuation of the conversation that we started last year. And I am just really looking forward to hearing from you and for the members of our audience, what the purpose of this particular project is. Uh, I'm sure that most people know that kids spend more time in elementary school than they do anywhere else. Um, and that's the time when they're developing their characters, their civic values. Uh, they're experimenting w to learn who they are going to be when they grow up. So helping kids nurture their voice and choice leads to growing good citizens. We need good citizens, I think, in this, for our democracy to survive. So what insights have you gained from your work through Inquiring Minds about civic education? Well, one thing I've learned is that kids learn from other kids. They are the experts on themselves. And that when they're when they're in the classroom, they're not necessarily learning from the teacher, they're learning from each other. And if that opportunity isn't there, if they're facing forward to looking at the teacher, for instance, all the time, that's eliminating the possibility that they can learn from their peers. At one point, just before COVID, we had started having town halls at this elementary school where the kids in, this, in the council that we'd started, stood on the stage and talked to the whole school. And we had mics that went around the, the uh, audience so that first graders could ask a question. That was amazing to see kids standing up with really well-formed ideas because they were forcing their brains to communicate what they wanted to know. And then the kids on the stage were listening with that same intensity. And if we can keep that up, if that kind of dialogue can be kept up through age combining, that is a huge advantage. The fifth graders want to talk to the fourth graders, the second graders, the third graders, the first graders. The first graders want to be fifth graders. It's it's a it's a really under resourced advantage of being in a school with such a range of ages. I also learned that the kids have this innate sense of fairness. 
and it's it's a very distorted sense of fairness. It's 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 very black and white until a certain age, and when you're at this younger age, you have to understand that that's how they're seeing the world. But you have to help them make the change between black and white to nuanced to the add the grays to allow for contradiction, and when you do that, that fills out the view of the world that they need. Thank you. Why the focus on early learners, DK? And is, is there a lot of research on elementary civic education to begin with? When we first started working on um, civic engagement, we went to visit Peter Levine at Tufts, who's one of the main educators who's thought this through. And he said to us very directly, you need to do this work in elementary school because there is so little out there. As Mike Rebell said, who is the executive director of the Center for Educational Equity, elementary school is a civics desert. Mm -hmm. If it's a civics desert, that explains why people are always so focused on high school because there's so much research in high school. It's a it's a it's an abundance of of um information to go off of, but they, it's like no one has really focused on the difference between elementary school and upper grades, which is this need to combine social emotional learning with all the all the subjects the kids are being taught. It's intertwined and in the intertwinement of those subjects with social emotional learning that kids actually can develop their sense of agency and voice and choice and incorporate what they've learned. You learn through active learning. You don't learn through passive learning. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, thank you, DK. What can the viewer expect in this video? What you're going to see is how kids respond when they're being really respected and asked questions that make sense to them where they know they can be honest and straightforward. So this is part of the research. It's like in order to do research, you have to go to the primary source. Kids, kids are the primary source in my mind. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from our young folks. So thank you so much, DK. And here we go. In our next segment, we're going to be speaking with five-year-old Gabriel. Gabe lives in Brooklyn, New York. He's in kindergarten at PS20 and loves to play soccer and go to music class. He's an animal lover, especially his parakeets. His mom, Jen Kuntz, is a psychoanalyst in Brooklyn. Let's hear what Gabriel has to say about civic education. Let's talk about your classroom community for a little bit, okay? Um, do you guys ever do votes in your class? Do you ever have votes? Two times. Two times? Can you tell me about one of those times? Well, one time... Um, we voted to see if we were going to do snack time and then go home or choice time and then snack time. Which and one? Then we did choice time and then snack time, which was my. Uh, oh, that was your vote. Okay. How would you have felt if the vote went the other way? Well, still good. <laughs> Both of those are pretty good options, right? Yeah, either snack time or choice time. Either one would be great. Um, how did other kids feel? Do you remember how maybe some of the kids who didn't vote for choice time felt? Um, no, but I just know the the ones who voted for choice time were happy. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. Um, well, let's imagine there was a tie. So let's let's pretend the same number of, of classmates voted. Like 10 people doing one vote and 10 people doing the other vote. Exactly. What do you think a fair way would be to handle that? Well, well, just doing just restarting the vote. And then if people change their minds, they can always do another vote. Okay, so we'll just vote again. Okay, and let's say they voted again and again and again and nobody changed their minds. What do you think would happen then? Then we would just, we would just like keep, like if somebody 
was like, let's stop voting because I know people will just keep not changing their minds. And then after that, they voted one more time and people changed their minds. Okay, so it sounds kind of like we're just going to be hopeful that people will see that we need to figure out an answer to our, our situation. So they'll keep voting and we'll just try and convince people. Do you think, what what do you think people on one side would do to try and get people to change their minds? Well, just talk to the other people. That's great. That's great. Have there ever been any times where you've had to try and get people to change their minds? No. Like me? Did you get me to change my mind? Yes. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, because I think you're talking about something that's super important, our ability to change our minds. Sometimes we think we support something or we want something, and then when we listen to other people, we actually find out that there are other ways for us to do things or other things for us to say are super important. So I like that idea that you mentioned of just talking to each other. That was great. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this idea of fairness. Is that okay? If you thought something unfair was happening in your classroom or in your school, what would you do? Um, try to stop it. Good. Okay. So let's say we tried to stop it. What are some ways someone could stop something unfair from happening? Well, just telling somebody just telling an adult that from that class and then the adult might be able to stop it. What if you thought the adult was doing something unfair? What are some options people might have then? Well, talk to the adult and tell her that she's doing something that she doesn't want, that the classmates don't think that is very good. I like that answer. So a word that folks use to describe that is advocating. It sounds like you, the person would advocate for their classmates or for themselves. And they'd say, hey, I don't think that's very fair. And of course, they would do it in a respectful way to get their ideas across. And hopefully the, the teacher or grown up would listen. I really like that answer. Thank you for sharing that. Um, can we talk about promises? Can you give me one example of a promise that was super important to you that someone kept? When did I say it? Um, in the year and the first, oh, and it was the first time to watch TV. Oh, so I promised that you could watch TV after school? Yes. I had to follow the rules that mommy said. What were the rules? Do um, you remember about your homework? Which I finished yesterday. What was the That I had to do my homework bef before I was able to watch TV. Now, I know this wouldn't happen, but let's say you did follow the rules but your mom didn't keep her promise. How would you feel? Bad. Why? Well, because um, I was following the rules that I was supposed to, but my mom didn't let me watch TV after school. Well, what about if your mom said you could watch TV, but you didn't follow the rules, but she didn't know? So you kind of broke your promise. How do you think she would feel? Bad. She'd feel bad? Why would she feel bad? Because I didn't follow the rules. So why do you think it would be important to her for you to follow the rules? Because you heard my request request after for a super long time. So you made that choice, but you didn't want to take it away. So you made those rules. Yeah, so Gabriel was advocating for a really long time to watch TV after school. Mm. So you kind of made a promise that if we could come with this agreement, this arrangement, you would do one thing, your mom would do another thing, and both of you would get something that you're looking for, right? 
So I think that that's really interesting. So you started by advocating. And then when you got to that compromise, you kept a promise and your mom kept a promise and everybody in the house is happier because of it. I think that's so awesome to hear. Even at such a young age, early learners have an impressive capacity for conflict resolution, making and upholding agreements, compromise, and advocacy. Thank you to Gabe and his mom for joining us. Next, we're going to be hearing from seven-year-old Lizzie. Lizzie is a second grader at Democracy Prep Harlem Elementary School. She lives in the Bronx with her sister and parents. We're gonna take a moment to introduce our principal, Ms. Palmer. Chelsea is the principal of Democracy Prep Harlem Elementary School. During her first year as principal, she started a scholar leadership council on her campus through which young scholars have learned the power of their voices and how to initiate changes that they want to see on their campus. In addition to her passion for civic education, Chelsea infuses her love of reading within her school community. Let's hear from Lizzie and Ms. Palmer. Part of a being a scholar at Democracy Prep Harlem Elementary School is that we follow our dream values. Can you share with everyone what are our dream values and why are those important? Important. Their names are discipline, respect, maturity, mm -hmm. enthusiasm, accountability. Can you give me an example? Yeah. And today, when when like you was not in your office, nobody mm -hmm. was in their office, nobody was in the hallway. Mm -hmm. But I saw like two little boys was running to go to get to water, and I was getting water too. Mm -hmm. And I said, "We walk in the school." Mm -hmm. But then the kids said, "No, you don't say that. Only the only Miss Palmer, all the teachers only say that, not you." You know what that? And they kept on running. <gasps> okay, well that lets me know that maybe. At our next town hall meeting, it's not just the teachers that are saying, and it's not just the principal or Miss Penuela, our assistant principal, saying no running in the hallways, that the kids have a voice in our school to make sure it's safe and that they uphold the rules and saying we walk in our school because that's the expectation and we listen to each other. And you say that to them because you care about that person and you care about our school community, and you want people to not just follow the rules, but you want them to be safe. You're looking out for them as a, as a scholar and as a citizen of our school. That was a really important, thank you for sharing that with me. Um, I'd like to ask you um, before we close out our interview, if you could tell the teachers one thing about teaching kids to be kind, good community members and dreamy scholars what would you tell them sometimes when they get like really get on your last nerves mm -hmm. you'd be like go and sit down for a second i need to handle this with somebody else instead of screaming at them and say go sit down mm -hmm. before you don't recess you could be like can you sit down for a second i need to handle this talk with somebody else because when probably when they grow up they're going to be the same way like do you go 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 and they were like oh yeah so I see this go 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 and they were like what where did you learn this from and you'd be like I learned that from my teacher you you should not be doing that screaming at the people and say go I'm talking to somebody now now go 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 you would tell the teachers to, that they need to take a deep breath and say, can you please go? Mm, yeah, that would, that's, that's showing respect, our dream values. And that is important. And you know what you said that is important? That the adults model that for the children. And you said how the kids, when they grow up, if they're doing that, the teachers model taking a deep breath. They model showing the dream values. That's really important. I'm going to share that with our teachers. Hi. Lizzie, thank you so much for that great interview. That was so awesome. So I want to thank you so much for your time. And if it's okay, I'd love to ask Ms. Palmer a few questions. Um, so Ms. Palmer, from your recent conversation with Lizzie about civic education, education in general, what insights did you gain regarding how young people perceive their role and their voice in the school community? I... Listening to Lizzie, it made me realize even more about the connection that kids feel to the school and how, well, she when she had told me about the um, 
that the little kids said that they, oh, you can't tell me not to run um, in the hallway um, because you're not an adult. That was an aha moment for me to make sure that I tell the kids that no, if somebody is telling you um, to be safe in our school community, their voice matters. Um, it's the same as if Miss Penwella or myself or Miss Kaleli was telling somebody not to run in the hallways. Kids too can make sure that they are not doing that. And that just made, that was one example. But then I can think about how there are other examples when kids that they can speak up too. You know, if somebody is not doing something in the classroom, how else can the kids come together to knowing that they have the ability to voice their change? Yeah, I, I think that it's fascinating how we need to remind our our young learners that they do have a lot of agency and they do actually hold positions of authority in their communities with their peers. And so they can enforce the rules, you know, and, and they can enforce fairness. So I, th- I think that's really cool that Lizzie gave us that opportunity to to think about that. So thank you, Lizzie, for, for helping us start thinking about that kind of stuff. Um, Ms. Palmer, can you share some examples of successful initiatives or programs that your school has implemented that encourages student active uh, advocacy and participation? Um, we were just talking about how sometimes scholars don't really think that they have that, that power to speak up and, and own their community. So what are some examples of anything that your, your school does? So in our, in grades three, four, and five, so Lizzie's in second grade right now, there is our student leadership council, our scholars, yes, okay, go ahead. You know Melanie, my sister? Yes, I do. Everyone says Melanie left, now we don't even get, now every day it's vegan day and vegetarian day. We don't get no meat anymore. And some people want chicken nuggets, but we don't get chicken nuggets so the chicken nugget issue, that's actually um, something that has to do citywide. Um, the mayor did a budget cut and chi- there are no more chicken nuggets on the menu um, because of that. Um, I can show you an article, um, but we, maybe we can write a letter to him because I know that that's it's been, a couple of kids have told me about the no chicken nuggets and how that's been bothering them. But that's not a decision that we made. And that's not a decision that our cafeteria leaders made that actually came from the mayor's office, I think, or the, even above or not. Well, I'll have to check to see that, but um, thank you for interjecting on that part. Um, Mr. DeRoso, to go back to your, um, to your question, in the upper grades, we do have the Scholar Leadership Council that consists of a president, a vice president, and a senator from each of the third, fourth, and fifth grade classrooms. Think initiatives that they have put in place um, have been we included in um, our new playground. That is an initiative from last year. Um, our playground, right, Lizzie, was not good. No. But um, I worked with Student Leadership Council, I worked with our Building Council, and I worked with our organization and the children had a say in helping to design the playground. And I think the playground looks good now. Something else um, that this year, um, the cafeteria um, didn't have, they weren't putting in the maple syrup with the pancakes. They were they were serving the pancakes and the children wanted the maple syrup and they wanted the specific grape jelly. Um, so the children in on the Student Leadership Council met with the fifth graders, they wrote letters and now the kids do have their maple syrup with their pancakes every morning um, or when the pancakes are served. So I do think that's an example of when the older kids have seen um issues in the school that they wanted to see change and how they've thought about how can they do this. But Lizzie's made me think about, okay, if I'm making sure that that our third, fourth, and fifth graders know that, but she is also telling me, hey, I'm in second grade and I'm telling kids that they should um, make sure that they're following the rules. As the principal, I want to make sure that I'm empowering all of the kids to know the, the importance of their voice in upholding our school rules because that helps make our community function. As we learn from Lizzie, it's incredibly important for us as the adults to model the kinds of behaviors and interactions we want to see in our young folks. They're paying attention. 
Thank you to Lizzie and Ms. Palmer for joining us for that conversation. Next, we're going to be hearing from nine-year-old Valerie. Valerie is a fourth grader at Hutchinson Elementary School in Pelham, New York. She'll be joined by her teacher, Ms. Sider. Gail Sider has taught fourth grade at Pelham for 24 years. Creating community and cultivating citizenship are her twin passions. She's spoken and written about the essential nature of elementary civics, but most importantly, she lives it every day with her students in her classroom. Let's hear from Valerie and Ms. Sider. So it's time for a little time travel. We're gonna go back to the beginning of the school year when we wrote our class constitution, okay? So what what is our constitution? What what is a constitution? Well, a constitution is basically the ground rules. Of course, there are other rules alongside it, but these are the main ones that we need to try our best to follow. And how do you remember the process of creating the constitution? Yeah, do you remember how um, we did that. And, and did you do that in other classes? Mostly, no, did not you? really, not really. No, so this was, was something new. Just like it was either just like the teacher read the rules, or just like um. Or we just did, or we just thought we knew what the rules were, basically. So I'm curious, how, how do you think the class would be different if a teacher just decided what the Constitution would be instead of the whole class? Well, honestly, also, no offense, but I feel like they would probably think that, like, for not being able to help at all, they would probably feel like if they didn't matter, if they felt like they didn't, like, it didn't matter, their opinion or stuff and stuff like that. If they felt like it didn't matter, they probably would have more trouble following the rules. I think that's really accurate. And and I remember, and maybe you get this experience too, when my parents just said, because I told you so. Oh, I don't I get did. that. Oh, that's good. Luckily. <laughs> I did. And I didn't like it so much. Yeah. Because I, that didn't really seem to make sense. No, it's to just me. because they're like they just act like because they're older, they can they can do everything they want when actually a lot of the times I'm right. <laughs> I bet you are. So I, I agree. I think it when you participate in making the rules, you are more engaged and you feel like you can accept the consequences because you reasoned your way through the rules. So we've we've been using the word community. Who do you consider to be part of our school community? Like uh, the teachers and the principal, of course. But there are still other people who work who work with her to be able to do things. Um, and I, I I don't know too much about the janitors, but I think the janitors, the custodians. Remember, we, in yes, addition sorry, to having our class constitution, we, we also created have a jan. We have also like have a little custodian, custodian rules, right? Yeah, we say that eat up on the table, put all of our cafeteria food in the compost bin. Well, I mean, it's leftover food. Um, remember to take. All our items we bring to the cafeteria, wipe up our spills, use as little soap and water as possible in the bathroom. That one's really important because we can easily waste water and soap we seem to easily run out of. Uh, we stack our classroom chairs at the end of every day. Right. So it sounds like you have a really good idea about the people whose rights we need to think about. Mm -hmm. Right. And who have responsibilities here in the school. Mm -hmm. well, I'm just curious what happens when we respect and uphold everybody's rights and we respect. Well, responsibilities. So if we do that, everybody gets treated how they deserve. Right. And as you were thinking about the other people who are beyond our classroom. Why is it important to consider all of them. And I think you, you started to say that it makes people happier to feel respected. Mm -hmm. It does. So it sounds like you're saying it's important for kids to have a voice in our classroom community. Uh -huh, exactly. And I think Rasheed might want to hear something more about that. Yeah. What are some ways you and your classmates get to share your voices in your community? Well, some ways that we can are classroom concerns. I think they're one of the best ways. So classroom concerns are where you can write something that you like, even like like a complaint or maybe even just something that you want to add, like how we added the class plants. 
and how we almost had the class bug. Too bad it crawled away. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of bug were were people thinking about? Hopefully not spiders. Um, we actually had no idea. It was just on. We just found it. it. It fell on my desk. Yeah, we actually, yeah, we actually, we actually found a bug. But we've had we've had some classroom concerns about getting a class pet. Yeah, which which we which, which we've had to mm -hmm. unfortunately we do have some rules that apply, but we're thinking about maybe adopting an, an oxalotl in the wild because we had a current event share about that about a fundraising campaign going on in Mexico. Exactly. Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. So the current events, and, which are important, mm -hmm. then maybe leads to a classroom concern. And also because of the classroom concern that uh, that about the class pets and because grace decided since we can't have class pets why don't we have class plants that's a great idea. and um surprisingly the cider is the only one that's been watering them <laughs> <laughs> let's say that miss cider decides that it, there are going to be class jobs and you are responsible for taking care of the class plant for the whole year if you didn't want to be the person to do that, I know you you actually do like nature and plants. No, yeah, I, I do like that probably. But imagine you didn't. And what? So how does that make you feel? And how do you react to the idea of not having choices in the classroom? Well, not well, not having choices just, is just like we need to do one thing, whether we want to do multiple or not. Well, having choice also means that we also get to see like what else we can do like it's not just like um it's not just like it's like everything that we can do and sometimes when it, it depending on what the choice is about you can actually do multiple things i see so it kind of gives you a bigger view of the possibilities of exactly. school then what are the what are the situations when you think it's most important for kids to have choices in the classroom? Um, I think that the most important time for us to have a choice is probably during, um, like, uh, when we're reading. We should have a choice whether to read nonfiction or fiction, and we should actually get to choose what that book is. Okay. That interview definitely highlights the importance of creating structures to promote student voice and choice. Thank you to Valerie and Ms. Sider for joining us. Next, we'll hear from Cruz, an 11-year-old, and he'll be joined by two neuroscientists, Senegal Mabry and Elizabeth Waters. Cruz is a fifth grader at PS20 and lives in Brooklyn, New York. He has a twin and an older sister. He loves to climb tall trees and play video games. Senegal Mabry is a second-year PhD student in the neuroscience area of the Department of Psychology at Cornell University. He's an alum of the Summer Program for Neuroscience Excellence and Success at the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole and a Society for Neuroscience Associate. He's team lead at the Community Neuroscience Initiative at Cornell, training pre-service educators to use neuroscience to innovate their classroom curriculum. Mabry serves on the Advisory Council of the Obama Foundation. He served as the Assistant to the Chancellor of NYSED for until 2020. Elizabeth Waters has a PhD in neuroscience and is the director of NYU's Makerspace and Experiential Learning Center. She's the chair of Inquiring Minds Institute. Elizabeth has two teenage daughters and lives in Manhattan. Looking forward to speaking to Cruz, Senegal, and Elizabeth. So I'm, I'm curious about uh, any experiences that you have in your classroom where, where you all vote on anything or make group decisions. At some point, uh, my dad was running this thing, uh, for this run to raise awareness, and we did this at least like once every two years, but so like three times in this school, and um, and it was a big thing. So each class, I think, had three options to run for things because. Uh, each grade, since it would be too much classes running for too much things, like each grade will like combine. So like all the fifth grade classes will be turned into one class. All the fourth grade classes will be turned into one class like that. So we we chose three options, but forgot the three options. But the entire class had to vote on what do we think we should um vote for and, and raise awareness for. That's really impressive. 
how did how did that voting experience make you feel? Um, it was pretty fun. It was fun to see people's uh, experience on it. Um, if you decide that there is something that you don't like or you want to have fixed, how would you go about, what would be your process to tell an adult? So for you, what would it look like if you were going to advocate for something that was really important to you? I would probably uh, wait at a certain time in class where I can um, go up to them and ask them if we can talk. And I'll tell them the problem and the situation. I'll tell them how to solve it. Yeah, I think I think that's a very logical approach. Now, let's imagine it's someone who is maybe a little set in their ways and they don't immediately listen, but it's really important to you. Tell me about your next steps. What would you do after that? Um, so I would try to convince them on why we should do this and how it'll help out other people for this too. Because I know, because I think in that situation, I would know other people are struggling in that situation. So I'll keep con convincing them until they give up and finally uh, try. I like that. That's very persistent and I think persuasive because you're presenting a lot of really uh, strong pieces of evidence to them and saying, this is why it needs to change. I think that's a really great process. Do you feel like there are other spaces in school where you can play or you can be creative? Are yes, there definitely. In two grades, kindergarten and third grade. Kindergarten and third grade. Can you tell me maybe one or two things you remember from either kindergarten or third grade? So first one from kindergarten is that, so we had to make a safari. It's much bigger than this wall, but there's a black chalkboard wall where the teachers got big, big piece of paper. And I'm pretty sure we made a giraffe the size of that entire wall, um, an elephant and probably a gazelle or a lion. Um, and then after that, um, we decorated the classroom in like safari grass, and it was really fun. So at, after the after the teachers came in, I looked around the class and I looked at myself, and it looked like everybody looked pretty proud about what they've done. That's such a, a wonderful memory, and I can tell that it must have meant a lot to you that that was in kindergarten, and you can remember all those details. That's incredible. Uh, what about third grade? So in third grade, they let you, if you're done with everything, they let you draw. And I draw a lot. And um, they let you be creative with things and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody just really liked the teacher, too, um, because she was really nice. So, like, this teacher, walk, when she walks in the hallway and my class is there, we're like, oh, hi, 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 remember me, hi. And is is that the case for all teachers or or that's a kind of rare thing to see? Uh, rare thing to see. Okay. And so it was because she was nice. I'm sure other teachers were nice. What was it no, about? Like, no. that... Cause, because, um, because, um, uh, she, it wasn't just she was nice, but like I told you earlier, she let everybody be very um, uh, creative and we got to um, do a lot of things that not all classes would normally do for fun. I see. I see. So I was hoping we could just go back for a moment just for folks who are not familiar with the term neuroliteracy. What does that actually mean? And, and what are the applications for civic learning um, that folks in the audience might be able to extract from that? That's a great question. I'm really interested in hearing Elizabeth's take on this too, but I'll, I'll, give, I'll give ours from the Community Neuroscience Initiative at Cornell University's. Um, there was a time when literacy, uh, reading literacy was uh, extremely rare. Um, meant only for the elites of society. 
And during that time, power was really concentrated on those folks who had clerical knowledge, um, the ability to communicate, to share perspectives, to you know participate in civic education, and um, also in um, political participation in business. All of those things were often conserved in this elite class of folks who were literate. Um, then years later, there was this explosion around um, math literacy, being able to get folks engaged in understanding the math around them to be able to do complex uh, problem solving or solve, you know, simple things like um, balancing a checkbook or, you know, reading out what, what, what's on a menu and knowing how to uh, manage cost. So now we're trying to step into neuroliteracy, which we think is really fundamental for student progress, but also could help democratize neuroscience generally because it's giving folks back access to um, this knowledge that's fundamental to themselves. Uh, everybody is carrying around their brain every day and it has these deep implications for how they're engaging with other folks, but also how they're engaging with uh, themselves. What if we gave folks a better understanding of how to read themselves, read their needs, communicate their needs out to other folks through neuroliteracy by talking about, um, you know, sleep, nutrition, mental health, social emotional learning, particularly at these early grades for students, so that they're um, becoming literate in the part of their body, this organ of their body that plays a critical role in how they develop as a human and their sense of self. That's our kind of take of neuroliteracy. And I think in, in elementary school, you know, in kindergarten, there's a lot of early discussion about feelings um, and interacting with other people and that it's something that could continue um, and easily be woven into conversations that you're having about a book or the struggles about having to do a math problem again or understanding why, why do you need to practice something that you already feel you're good at? Um, these are, I mean, these are things that teachers, you know, in fifth grade and middle school, high school could be working with their students on. I, um, one thing I dislike sort of this urban myth, you know, that a young adult, their, their brain isn't fully formed yet. That's why they're making bad decisions. Like their executive function hasn't fully developed, but you have, we have executive function our entire lives. <laughs> um, and so, but it takes practice. Right. And I think, um, one thing that we need to add to our conversations that we have in classrooms about like teaching students to be okay with failure, teaching them how to fail is also to understand that bad decisions are good brain practice. Bad decisions help your brain develop and, and help students work through, uh, those situations. And, you know, I, talking to Cruz, there were times where I was like, Oh, I wish you had spoken up, like maybe not speaking up. Um, was a bad decision. Um, and, you know, could the teachers help uh, students learn learn to advocate for themselves? It's, um, you know, Cruz had stories of where that was already happening in his, his classroom. Um, and I'd like students to, uh, and students and teachers be able to work together more on, on that. Listening to what Cruz was saying in Senegal, you can agree or disagree with me. I think that like sort of the level of self-awareness um, of a fifth grader, of an 11 year old is something that I hadn't appreciated. Um, and so everything I sort of associate with where somebody needs to be in their development in fifth grade, like this curiosity and wanting to have connection um, is all, was all there and more. Like him, him expressing like this desire to have creativity, these memories of creativity in kindergarten and third grade were actually really stories about self-efficacy and agency in his classroom. Um, it makes me think of what comes next. And again, from my having my daughters, like starting this conversation about your, your body and your brain and fifth grade, he's entering middle school, understanding what's going to be happening to him next cognitively now that he can think abstractly and um uh, and go from there um like Senegal when you mentioned th this idea of neuroliteracy it just really really resonated with me as a part of civic education that we don't consider in order to be an, an agent in your community you have to have some self-awareness you have to have appreciation for what the human condition is and and seeing him 
teed up for that so perfectly by his teachers, even though he didn't view every teacher as, as contributing as much to his education, that's fair. Um, we're all individuals. Like, I just really uh, appreciated that about listening to Cruz's comments. Yeah, I mean, I would I would completely agree with that. In some cases, it's less about, you know, brain formation than it is about exploration, like really being able to understand what is the expertise that our young people have, um, you know, starting from these early grades, starting from kindergarten um, into now fifth grade. Really what we've seen is um, that Cruz is an expert in himself and his interests and his passions. And so being a given the opportunity to explore those and to find, you know, classroom engagement or to find relationships with teachers and teacher leaders that let Cruz, you know, be Cruz um, uh, and find passion and interest and voice in those spaces, I think is what's critical. Um, and then really I got a lot on just the importance of this teacher leader in introducing folks to their voice and their vision and these different passions and experiences. Some of that is from different classroom management styles, but it, all of it goes back to the relationship that our teachers help our young people develop, um, you know, the, the relationship between a teacher and a student in terms of their developmental progress, but also in sparking interest and passions and things like science or, you know, physical activity or uh, just, just exploring and finding what is going to make this student interested in being in the classroom and interested in sharing their voice. That's why I got out of that conversation with Cruz. You know, I think to your last point, I, I find it fascinating that in some of the con conversations we've been having with young folks, um, there there seems to be a, a pattern that I've observed where young folks have quite a bit to say, but because they have not been specifically prodded to contribute their voices, they don't seem to have a sense that what they have to say matters. So it's not necessarily that there's an environment that is stifling youth voices, but no one is actually saying like, what you have to say matters and I want to hear from you and walking from through the steps of advocacy. Uh, with Cruz, I think it's an interesting case because he, in many situations knows exactly what to do. And I don't know if that's necessarily the case for every fifth grader. He knows how to advocate for himself and he's selecting moments when it matters. But it also seemed at certain points that there weren't necessarily teachers who had created a context in which he felt like he could actually walk through the steps that he knew uh, that he would need to take to bring about a uh, positive change. Um, I was wondering if we could focus now just on this idea of a sense of agency in the learning process. Uh, how important is agency as a factor that educators should be taking into consideration as they're working with younger students, but also as, as it applies to you know middle grade and upper grade students as well? The, the first thing I wanna say is I, I really wanna go back to Elizabeth's point on um, you know getting students access to more information is, we're, we're often talking about like the, the products of the work or teachers are taught, oh, this is how you foster a classroom around social emotional learning, but introducing students to like, what is an emotion so they can recognize that inside of their own bodies, understand what's happening, you know, cognitively, but also physiologically, you know, those, those, those types of conversations to me are the root things that help build up agency because if they can recognize it then they can start to communicate it and they can share it with voice. But ultimately a core thing beyond the, um, the, the, the fancy science elements or bringing in neuroscience in the classroom to me just seems to be the relationship element between our teachers and our students and building a stronger relationship between them comes from having them better understand one another and better understand one another's needs. Um, and if our students feel like, as I think we were getting from Cruz's conversation, feel like this is a person that they either will have a strong relationship with, either from repeated exposure or from trust, from the types of engagements in the classroom, then that's the like setup bed. That's the, 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 the field ground for 
agency where they can start to make really great decisions or make decisions that they are that are steering um, their learning, their health, uh, their needs uh, in the classroom in the right way. And, you know, I think putting that need for agency, you know, into this larger context of the community and, and what we're here to talk about today, civic engagement, you know, a student feeling that, a young person feeling that they have agency um, helps them experience, you know, that experience that they can contribute to fairness, that they can contribute to a sense of justice in their community, that they can be someone who is a partner with other people um, in order to you know, bring forward those things that are they think they're important for their community. And, and childhood is very much marked by this, this desire for fairness, um, this awareness that some people have more, some people have less, um, but they need that agency in order to be able to engage in those conversations about fairness and um, and participate in, in building a better community. Efficacy, agency, and trust are critical for young people's civic development. Thank you to Cruz, Senegal, and Elizabeth for joining us for that conversation. In our final interview, we'll be hearing from David, a 17-year-old, and New York State Regent Fran Wills. David is a high school senior and an alumnus of the Inquiring Minds Institute. Having participated in various civic-related programs developed by Inquiring Minds starting in third grade, he is a current member of the Inquiring Minds Student Think Tank. David is a lifelong resident of Brooklyn, New York. Fran Wills was elected to serve as a New York State Regent in April 2020 after retiring as a superintendent of schools in Putnam Valley, New York. Dr. Wills spent three years as a consultant and coordinator of professional development for Pace University's School of Education. She served as a superintendent of schools in Briarcliff Manor, New York for 16 years. A Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Hunter College, Fran holds an MA from Cornell University and an MED from University of Maine, Orono. Let's hear what the two of them have to say. I see the teacher as just there to advise. We come up with our own ideas and we make teaching student-led. Well, David, that was a, a clip of you from many years ago. And yes. uh, I just want to thank you for your openness to talk about your progression through the education system. Now you're a high schooler uh, preparing for life after secondary. Um, so I, I wanted to start by asking you if you could share any experiences or lessons in civic education that had a significant impact on your understanding of your role in your community. In class, there was a learning role, which is what I was discussing in that clip. And uh, just the ability to, to collaborate as a community and really respect one another's intellectual differences and, and perspectives. It really made you appreciate that like everyone in that room has something to say and the capacity to say it in a way that will will enrich you and when you value the, the members of your classroom and community you want to advocate for them and you develop a community that you want to participate uh, in and and engage with so that was that was like the first hint in my life where I was just like the people around me are so capable and for me to not engage with them and and try to help them in any way that I can would be um, stifling growth within myself and within others. Thank you. Yeah. And I think in your response, I'm hearing just one of the fundamental principles of democracy, this equality of voice and the valuing individuals for whatever they bring to the community, but also this sense of commitment, knowing who these folks are and feeling that sense of actual uh, school identity and community identity as being important to you uh, as a motivator. I think that's phenomenal. Um, this whole webinar, this whole video series has really been focused on civic learning in the early grades. Why do you think it's important to start civic education so early? How do you think it would benefit students and how did it benefit you as, as, as young folks grow older? Um, well, I think that obviously uh, youth sets the precedent for, for how you uh, just perceive others going forward. And so when you fail to develop 
a civic mind and then foster it and enrich it at a young age, uh, you really detract from the abilities and the desire that, that um, older children will have in, in participating. Just because if you don't use it while, while it's still in that developmental stage, well, you're still a, a very creative and brilliantly lost child. Um, it just, you, you lose the, the joy in it. And when you fail to see the joy in, in speaking and being heard, mm -hmm. you don't ever truly recover, I don't think. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it sounds in part like you're talking about also a sense of efficacy in addition to joy. So yeah. the, the joy disappears uh, kind of alongside a sense of, well, when I speak and when I do things, there's an actual impact here. So I, I really appreciate that response. In your experience with early learning, if you can remember, uh, is, can you pinpoint a time or a teacher or a class when you truly felt like your voice mattered? Uh, my my school was like on the cusp of of like going leaning more into civics as I was exiting it. So during my experience with elementary school, um. A large part of it, I just felt as if um, my voice was not heard. I, I felt as if I was subservient to the teacher. Um, my role was to fulfill their expectations of me. Mm -hmm. And my voice didn't necessarily hold the same weight as theirs. They, they were educated. They were older. I felt as if um, what I had to say was not as potent as what they. Um, but, you know, towards the end of my fifth grade year, that classroom was, was very democratic in a lot of ways. We, we looked really into um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We, we had the learning wall, the, the collaborative experiences. And so I think towards the end, I, I started to feel as if what I had to say was was valuable and the input that my, my classmates was all, had um, were, were also valuable. We also had this program called Kids Council where um, uh, outside of school, it was an after school program, and we, we had elections, we voted on, on leaders, we voted on issues that we saw within the school that uh, we wanted to address. And then the very um, uh, methodical way we, we address them. So we'd, we'd do surveys, we'd do polls, um, and it was very liberating to see what classmates thought and seeing how it often um, intersected with your own beliefs. So that, that was a point where I felt as if my voice was heard. Thank you. I, you. You point out that civics is not just history class. It's actually learning to use your voice, learning to get along with folks, learning how to uh, navigate conflict and, and engage with new ideas. So I really want to thank you, uh, David. And I'd actually like to transition now to, to Fran and... I, you've previously seen uh, a number of the clips from our video series, and now you and I both had the opportunity to listen to David's perspectives as someone who moved through the early education system and is now finishing secondary education. I was hoping you could maybe tell us how you see the intersection between, more explicitly, the intersection between social emotional learning and civic education, and how integrating them can really prepare our young folks for lives of active and empathetic citizenship? Thank you for the question, because it has to do gre greatly with how we give students the opportunity to be who they are and to try to understand who they are. So the culturally responsive and sustaining framework that New York State has, I feel is one of the strongest paradigms to help in, in, in the classroom, to help a teacher to develop a classroom that recognizes this. It is very important to recognize that every child comes 
with a different experience, a different background, a life, a family, that is very different one from the other. That understanding is not something that I experienced when I went to school uh, in, the fort, in the late 40s, the 40s and 50s. Um, every child was supposed to come with a certain mindset, a certain way of being in a classroom. If you didn't have it, you were excluded. And there was no, the teachers were not asking you about that, about what you are coming with. Today, we have these community circles that teachers have where students can talk about their feelings, um, where teachers in conversations with parents, they build a sort of a framework to help understand um, what this child needs and allow the child to tell their story. So you could start as a teacher by telling your story and then students can tell their story. And that story helps to inform how that classroom community is, for, is formed. And David mentioned that he heard, he said he heard from different students about their lives, about their strengths, about what they could offer. And that that helped him to see how remarkable it was that every individual comes with something unique. And ex that expression, that ability to, um, to be who you are in the classroom is sort of that foundation for developing the first principle of cultural framework, which is an affirming and welcoming environment. And when you dig into what that means, it's very, it's quite deep. It's quite deep because every child has uh, something to offer, but every child uh, has some, some fears, some anxieties that um, are not immediately noticed, but as it, as the, you start to develop a classroom community, you see that today, especially with so many newcomers in our schools, they have been through suffering. They have been through traumatic events. And to ignore that is to deny humanity. We're trying to build communities where everyone is seen as fully human and fully someone who I can embrace. So, I think that um, social emotional learning has, you know, various aspects to it. But one of the main things is to give kids strategies to help kids develop strategies, not even to give it to them, but have them learn about strategies that can help them manage their fear, manage their concerns, their, their feelings of in, in inadequacy to build confidence uh, because it's confidence that David has developed. and. How do we make sure that every child feels confident, confidence, faith in oneself, ability to express a, their voices? I heard those clips and it was so remarkable. The one student, and I'm sorry, I don't remember her name, but the student who talked about the teacher yelling and the teacher had taught the students, one of the rules was you don't yell. And then the student told the teacher, but you're yelling. <laughs> and just the fact that the student had the courage to say that, I would never have had that in school when I went to school. And hopefully the teacher heard that and was able to do some metacognitive stuff and say, wow, you know, I have to look at myself and know who I am. So the social emotional learning is absolutely integral and the strategies around that to teachers being effective in the classroom. That's why we talked about the trauma-informed classroom, um, you know, which it means that you know your students, you know what triggers your students. Um, you know that you can develop, help students develop this community where they can help one another. As David said, how do I help the people who I am with on a daily basis? It's, this, it's building a culture. Every interaction counts. Something that resonated was an idea of building confidence. I mean, there was so much about what you said that, that really uh, moved me, uh, especially about just affirming folks' humanity right, at, at the foundation. And, and that just being one of the primary uh, prerequisites for a school to effectively do its work. I wanted to know if you had any general reactions to anything David shared that, that resonated with you 
or that kind of made you think of some of the earlier uh, video clips that you had seen? Well, what, what resonates with me is the fact that if we don't explicitly develop ways to help students understand their community and how um, democracy works and how fairness and justice work uh, more explicitly, that students develop, no matter what, they will develop a sense of what the world is about and what that community is. And what they develop is a, a, a sort of a, the concept of civics will be one where there is power in one place, where certain voices um, are given more legitimacy, and um, where they feel um, either heard or not. They will develop a framework for what we talk about as civics. Um, and so it's it's sort of an existential experience that we have. We know when we're in certain room, we know as adults, we're in certain places, we can immediately tell who is the person who has the power in that room, um, whose voices are being heard, whose voices are not being heard. It happens whether we teach it or not. And the, for us, our goal is to develop a way to teach it where students are participating in the learning with us and we can help them, we can guide them, as David pointed out, guide them in understanding what is what is happening in our environment and who the people are in our environment and um, what are the strengths that people bring to the table and how can I make sure that I am listening so that those strengths are given a, a place. There was an exhibit of student work on the topic, my impact on the community. That was the topic. And there was the artwork that students did of their family and the kinds of hobbies they had and how they contributed. They donated uh, clothing, they planted uh, vegetables at school in their garden. And so, so the students were in third or fourth grade. So this personal connection with the community is what civics is about in the early grades because the community is the classroom. And the teacher helps students to feel that they are full participants in that community. And they bring to it who they are. And every child has something to bring. Every child can make an impact in that community. So that's what I was thinking of when David was talking and, um, and the marvelous kinds of experiences he brought to the table. It's imperative that we help young people see themselves as valued members of their communities. And we must also help cultivate a sense of confidence in their ability to affect positive change. Thank you to David and Fran for joining us. We hope the insights shared by both students and adults throughout this video have resonated with you, sparking a deeper understanding and appreciation for the importance of early civic learning. We encourage you to commit to adopting or continuing some of the practices that were highlighted. We also ask that you continue to advocate for quality civic learning experiences starting in the early grades so that we can continue to empower future generations with the knowledge and the skills they need to thrive and build the kind of world we all deserve to live in. Thank you again.